Andy. Um, let me say continue there. Uh, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you this morning uh, Dr. Rick Hobson, who is an electrophysiologist here and clinical associate professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Iowa. Uh, he is a graduate of the Carver College of Medicine here in Iowa City and also completed his residency in internal medicine and cardiovascular disease and electrophysiology fellowships here as well. Um, he is presenting today on ECG tips for the experienced reader, uh, which I think everybody's going to enjoy. Uh, and with that, I turn it over to you, Rick. Yay. So uh, I'm sorry, everybody, about the CME thing. And uh, it's uh, there's a lot of little administrative loopholes and hoops to jump through to do that. So uh, we'll try harder next time. Uh, Anyway, uh, I'm just a giant fan of the EKG. It is an amazing, it's you know, such a simple test, but it's one that has, uh, that has stood the test of time. You, it's hard to think of a more important test in the, in the cardiology world uh, that's basically unchanged for almost a hundred years and yet pivotal, critical to the management of, of, of patients with heart disease. So uh, a tip of the hat to Willem Eindhoven. Uh, I always thought he was German, but I guess he's Dutch. Uh, got the Nobel Prize for inventing the EKG. Uh, so with that, uh, off to you. So um, we could, we could talk, there's so many topics on the EKG and um, you know, we could just, we could you know, spend weeks at this sort of thing. So I thought uh, the thing to do maybe was just hit a few things that I, uh, you know, you see these, these little annoying errors come through the interpretation pile and little, you know, areas of, of, of disagreement maybe about what a diagnosis is and that sort of thing. But uh, if, you know, if you're in a busy cardiology practice, you're gonna see a lot of tracings come through and uh, there's just a few little hot button areas where there's where you're gonna, you know, be there's gonna be some head scratching. So I thought we'd talk about uh, atrial fibrillation and its cousins. Is it a fib or a lie? Uh, we might just hit on some pacemaker stuff. I thought it was funny. It is. Yeah. And then uh, my favorite area, parasystole and concealment, uh, the truffles of the EKG world. They are not nearly. They're they're hardly important at all. But if you're into a big fan of the EKG like I am, then you look for these things and you put those in your, in your file box. So this is an actual patient referred to me for atrial fibrillation. Um, this patient was sent on Xarelto and digoxin. The reason for bringing it up is that this is not atrial fibrillation and he did not need to be on Xarelto. This is an arrhythmia for which digoxin is not gonna be helpful. So you're thinking big deal. Well, I mean, there are some, there's expense and risk of taking Xarelto. This person didn't need Xarelto for what's, this is an atrial tachycardia, a little repetitive atrial tachycardia. We're treated to a couple beats of sinus rhythm and then little runs of PACs, then sinus, excuse me, sinus rhythm again, and then repetitive runs of PACs. So, um, you know, there is, there are some clinical consequences of making other than just in principle, trying to make the correct diagnosis. You know, there are some sequelae for that. So these are things that often get mislabeled as atrial fibrillation. Uh, basically, these are uh, trace, these are supraventricular uh, rhythms that are themselves irregular. And so if you're just, you know, kind of, kind of brushing through things, atrial fibrillation is so common that you're going to see these little things uh, come by irregular supraventricular rhythms. You know, tempted to go, oh, AFib, AFib. Well, not always. So let's agree that this is atrial fibrillation. This is also a person with RVH, but atrial fibrillation is, I want you to, to focus on this being, you know, fine, irregular, confused atrial activity, which you can see obviously here. And we can all agree that this is atrial flutter, okay? This is typical atrial flutter. So you're gonna to get to some disagreement in, for tracings like this. Uh, here, this is something that most experienced cardiologists would call atrial fibrillation. 
but you might go, hey, well, it's got some distinct, you know, generally uh, similar looking atrial activity. Uh, you might get, I would probably call it, I'd call it AFib, but you could call it coarse atrial fibrillation, but I don't want you to call it atrial flutter because you can see in some, in some uh, leads, that's the beauty of the 12 lead, you get 12, 12 different looks at it, that it's, it's not monomorphic, it's a little bit irregular, and sometimes it just kind of falls apart. So if you're gonna call it atrial flutter, I want you to have, I want you to have consistent repetitive uh, atrial activity uh, going on in there. So another area of confusion is um, in the world of SVT, is it atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter? Now in the, in the olden days, back in the, when EKG textbooks and EKG definitions were being written, the difference between atrial tachycardia and atrial flutter was based on rate. And with the rate cutoff being roughly 250 beats per minute, and now that we're in the EP lab and we understand a little bit more about mechanisms of arrhythmia, uh, the term atrial flutter by most people that are into EP refers to macro reentrant uh, rhythms in the atria. It can be right atrium or left atrium or both atria, but these are, uh, these are uh, reentrant uh, atrial rhythms and an atrial tachycardia uh, uh, is a term that's used for something that is focal. Sometimes it's a little hard to tell. For example, in this tracing, anything that's conducted rapidly, it's a little difficult to know uh, exactly what's going on. This is a long RP SVT that the mechanism becomes clear uh, when a little bit of deltaism is given. And you can see now you have two to one conduction and it's much easier to see what's going on. This is an atrial tachycardia. And the reason I'd like you not to call it atrial flutter is because these P waves are so discrete and there's a nice isoelectric segment between them. So this is an atrial tachycardia. Here on the other hand is a rhythm that is almost of identical rate and it looks like SVT. This is a patient with sleep apnea who's uh, heavy, has metabolic syndrome, recurrent palpitation. And again, after a little bit of deltaism, you can see that now this is an arrhythmia that's conducted two to one. And I invite you to call this atrial flutter. And the reason is because this rhythm, there's no isoelectric segment on this rhythm. You can see that it has a sawtoothy looking uh, pattern to it. So that first tracing, I'd like you to call atrial tachycardia and this one atrial flutter, very similar rates. And again, moving away from differentiating flutter and atrial tachycardia based on rate, as opposed to trying to infer mechanism based upon the EKG. It may not be always possible to tell, but that's, that's kind of where these definitions are, are moving. Here's a fellow who has intermittent palpitation, uh, was uh, presented, found to have this on his EKG, it was called atrial fibrillation, was started on Eliquis. On Eliquis, he developed, uh, he fell, had some bleeding behind his eye, and so came for atri advanced atrial fibrillation care. Well, this is not atrial fibrillation, okay? It's a little bit difficult to tell, but if you spend a little bit of time and look at this tracing, you can see that there's discrete atrial activity marching through here at 160 beats per minute or so. So this is a person, the arrhythmia is not atrial fibrillation, he did not need to be on Eliquis. Uh, he did not need to have uh, bleeding behind his, his uh, eye. And so you're, this is, the EKG is not straightforward. Uh, and that's of course why we're talking about it now. Um, and there are some tricks to, you know, maybe if he had been given some uh, metoprolol or something, the conduction rate would have slowed. But even if it's, even if you can't make out discrete atrial activity, which I think you can, because that's, that's what the arrows are for. Anytime you see arrows, that's what, the, and you're going to see a lot of arrows today. But if you're thinking, well, that's just a little too subtle. Um, well, if you look over here on the last half of the 12 lead EKG, these QRS complexes are suspiciously regular. And anytime you're going to make an atrial fibrillation diagnosis, and at some point on the 12 lead, you see very regular QRS complexes, I want you to question the diagnosis. 
Here's another fellow who's had atrial fibrillation, has had an atrial fibrillation ablation, returns with palpitation. Uh, this was called sinus rhythm, sinus tachycardia. Well, it's not sinus tachycardia. It's one of these post ablative atrial flutters. Again, the positive arrow sign, you can see discrete atrial activity kind of rumbling through there. The reason I'm inviting you to call this atrial flutter is that in some leads, you can just see that the, the baseline just never completely settles out here like an ABF or two here. The, there's just no isoelectric uh, piece to this EKG. So this is atrial flutter. We do a lot of atrial fibrillation ablation here as, as other big medical centers do. And one thing that you'll see in, a, uh, in these patients is the possibility that they'll return with, a, with atrial flutter. It's usually in, off swimming around in the left atrium someplace. This is, this tracing is uh, a little less clear, but this is a fellow who's presenting with palpitation and some chest discomfort. Uh, this is a person who's having a, an acute inferior infarction is already queued out the inferior leads has persistent ST segment elevation, but is also in a non-sinus rhythm. Uh, again, you can see discrete atrial activity kind of marching through here. It's a little unclear because of the conduction rate and these frequent PBCs as to whether this is tachycardia or flutter. It's probably atrial flutter, but it's not sinus rhythm. It's a not, it's a, it's a atrial arrhythmia that's pushing his rate at a time when he does not need to be tachycardic. He might be shocky. Maybe he needs a cardioversion. Definitely needs his right coronary opened up. So here's a fella in the ICU with uh, shortness of breath. Uh, this particular EKG was called atrial fibrillation. It's not atrial fibrillation. This is uh, an ICU, MICU rhythm called multifocal atrial tachycardia. It's frequently confused for atrial fibrillation, which is unfortunate for a couple reasons. One is that this rhythm does not respond to cardioversion. Two, there's no suggestion that, 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 uh, anti, that anticoagulation is needed for this rhythm. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't respond to digoxin and it responds to, to pulmonary directed care, oxygen, steroids, antibiotics, that sort of thing. Again, the criteria for MAT, the rate has to be over a hundred and there have to be at least three different P wave morphologies. And ideally it should be difficult to discern which one of those P wave morphologies is sinus. Here's another uh, uh, EKG demonstrating multifocal atrial tachycardia. This in an elderly fellow with a COPD exacerbation. Again, this was called atrial fibrillation. But you can see out front, it's in some leads like AVL or lead one. Uh, if you had been presented that, you would call that atrial fibrillation and you would have been, that would have been perfect. Uh, but you have 12 leads. And if you're lucky enough to get 12 lead uh, recordings of the arrhythmia, you're going to be uh, you're going to be in good shape. So in this one, lead, lead, lead V1 clearly shows atrial activity, different types of atrial activity out in front of each QRS complex. So this is not atrial fibrillation. It does, you know, cardioversion will not help. He does not need uh, eloquence. He needs pulmonary care. So here's a a fellow with uh, hypertension presents with intermittent skips in his pulse. So he was started on Coumadin, referred for atrial fibrillation management. Well, this is not atrial fibrillation. This is sinus rhythm that's interrupted by little salvos of repetitive atrial tachycardia. Uh, it's the reason I'm not calling this flutter is because uh, there is, these are of distinctly different rates here. Sometimes the atrial activity is relatively closely coupled, as you can see over here. Sometimes the atrial activity is further apart, uh, 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 flutter and other reentrant rhythmias are notoriously, not always, which we might see later, but notoriously uh, regular. And this is just a focal repetitive uh, uh, atrial arrhythmia, it looks to be of one focus and 
you know, insofar as it's upright in V1, probably someplace in the left atrium, lateral left atrium, and um, but not atrial fibrillation. Importantly, does not need to be on Coumadin. Needs either antiarrhythmic therapy or ablation. Here's another uh, Holter of a patient with a similar type of arrhythmia. You can see sinus rhythm that is interrupted by little trains of repetitive uh, atrial arrhythmia. There's a little P wave hidden in there. So this is not sinus rhythm here. This is a patient who was again called atrial fibrillation, but um, you know, the, the guidelines, CHADS VAS scores don't apply to this patient. Here is a 61 year old. I threw this in just because I'm, I'm always a little bit, uh, it's just one of my favorite tracings. So this is a 61 year old uh, gal who has had, was referred for atrial flutter after having had prior heart surgery. And so you can see down here in three and ABF, there looks to be pretty clear atrial flutter activity, but up here in V1, it doesn't look, I don't see atrial flutter, it looks like sinus P waves. One kind of funny thing, if you're gonna call this atrial flutter, is that it doesn't look like the atrial flutter has much to do with the QRS complexes. You know, it almost marches out here like it would be uh, three to one atrial flutter, but by the time you get over here, they don't quite march out very well. Whatever is going on in V1 marches out completely well with the QRS complexes, but this, this kind of funny flutter looking activity doesn't, doesn't march out very well. So this is a person who has had uh, a heart transplant and the, there's a little cuff. This is a person I took to the uh, lab just to confirm the mechanism of this. And there was a little cuff of atrium, part of the, of the remnant part of the native uh, atrium that was involved in atrial flutter. But the donor heart, which included the sinus node and the body of the, of the atrium was indeed in sinus rhythm. So it's just a little cuff of fluttering atria up there that didn't have anything to do with the, with the heart rate and was not felt to represent a thromboembolic risk and produced a great EKG, but could be ignored. And I think in your medical practice, you'll see exactly zero of those cases. But if you did see one, perfect. Here's a uh, gal that I cared for for, oh, 20 years, 15 or 20 years. Uh, who um, had uh, coronary disease, advanced ischemic cardiomyopathy, had chronic atrial fibrillation, was said to have third degree heart block and had a bi-V defibrillator in place, was admitted with bouts of tachycardia. So this was called atrial fibrillation and she was admitted for atrial fibrillation management. And indeed, the, this is an irregular tachycardia with a right bundle morphology, but the the QRS complexes are just grossly atypical for conducted right bundle branch block. So this, uh, this person was admitted and received a little bit of, of amiodarone and this was the resultant EKG. This person did have third degree heart block, was PACER dependent, and this rhythm was an irregular ventricular tachycardia. She had a, a huge scar down in the uh, in the ventricle with a lot of little circuits throughout the scar that would allowed her to to have a irregular ventricular tachycardia which is unusual but again this is a uh, not not everything that's irregular and over 100 beats per minute is going to be atrial fibrillation and this is one of those examples which is of course why i brought it up and how might you know that uh, well you're going to go this this QRS morphology looks funny. And I just, I, I don't buy it. Plus I'm told this person has third degree heart block. And so I'm gonna question the diagnosis. And if you had done that, you would have been exactly right. Cause this person did have heart block and was pacer dependent. And this is the, her rhythm when ventricular tachycardia was terminated. 
sometimes, especially if you just have like one lead, like if, if you're on telemetry or down in the emergency room, uh, it's going to be a little hard to sort out. This is a person who is in the emergency room, has known right bundle branch block and presents with palpitation and has a completely regular uh, right bundle conducted tachycardia. And I'm looking at this and I don't, I can't see what's going on. So it's a little hard to know, uh, but one tool in your arrhythmia toolbox is gonna be something to slow the conduction rate. It might be carotid sinus massage, it might be metoprolol or adenosine or diltiazem, but these are tools that uh, could be therapeutic, uh, but can also be diagnostic. So this is a person uh, who presents in that sort of fashion, a little bit of a head scratcher, what's going on. This person got diltiazem and immediately uh, it was quite clear what's going on. This is a person with typical atrial flutter who was conducting uh, two to one and adenosine exposed that, produced a kind of a little bit of a gaspy session of bradycardia, which got better and cleared up. So a diagnosis was made, uh, treatment was not affected, but this person could then be stabilized by IV diltiazem, referred for cardioversion or ablation. And that's what was done for this person. Anyway, if, it's, if you're a little confused by it, then slow the rate down and see what's going on underneath. Get, get a peek at that atrial activity. Sometimes um, things are just uh, subtle. You have a narrow complex tachycardia and it's just a little unclear what is going on. And so this is when you get out your, your readers, your, your calipers, and you start kind of poking around. This is a fellow who's had prior AFib ablation and has recurrent um, tachycardia. And cl on close inspection, good for AVR, you know, the forgotten lead. No one pays attention to AVR. It's like Pluto. It's barely a planet. It's barely a lead. And I think we could probably, in most circumstances, get by with a not a 12 lead EKG, an 11 lead EKG would usually work. But here, AVR has, has uh, saved us. Because you can see a little subtle atrial activity up there that marches out. This turns out to be one of these Although you can also see it down here in V12, little discrete atrial activity. So uh, sometimes uh, it's in the details. Here is a uh, gal who's heavy, has sleep apnea, has been treated uh, with flucanide for atrial fibrillation, returns with palpitation. Again, you have an irregular right bundle pattern tachycardia. It looks to be supraventricular. It's a little unclear what's going on. Uh, let's get out those calipers. And I never go any place without my calipers, Swiss current calipers with a jeweled movement. That's what you want. Anyway, um, you pay a little attention. Hey, wait a minute. I can see discrete atrial activity here, kind of marching right on through. It's very slow for atrial flutter, but this person is on flecainide, and flecainide has the ability to slow atrial flutter and produce these sort of wide um, uh, 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 flutter waves down there. I'm not sure that it is atrial flutter. It may be an atrial tachycardia. There does appear to be maybe a little, the rate is like super slow, even for flecainized atrial flutter. But it is a, it's either atypical atrial flutter or an atrial tachycardia with variable conduction. Here's another person referred for atrial fibrillation was placed on Eliquis. Uh, and this is not atrial fibrillation. And you can see that this is a narrow complex tachycardia with a little P wave sitting out there. And you're thinking, hey, maybe this is like AV node reentry or something. The tachycardia stops. You're treated to two sinus beats. And then the arrhythmia starts right back up here. Your first beat, return beat of the arrhythmia is right there. You can see it on this little blown up pieces for which arrows have been provided free of charge for you. But this is not AV node reentry. This is an atrial tachycardia 
that starts right back up here. And you can see this P wave kind of march back into the QRS complex. So it's not AV node reentry, it's not atrial uh, fibrillation, it's not atrial flutter, it's a recurrent uh, atrial tachycardia, ectopic atrial tachycardia. So uh, Eliquis is not needed. Uh, this person needs either antiarrhythmic therapy or ablation. Here is a gal that I, or a person I care for in, a uh, young man I care for in Dubuque with a history of atrial fibrillation and uh, has had mitral valve repair and a surgical maze procedure with recurrent palpitation. And it looks kind of like there's uh, sinus rhythm going on up here, but this is not sinus rhythm. You can see, see if I get some arrows here. There we are. Uh, you can see there's discrete atrial activity marching right on through here. And I called this atrial flutter because in some leads you just get this, this sense that there's no baseline here. So this person, as it turns out, has uh, atrial flutter that is living in and around the left atrium and swims around these uh, surgical maze uh, lesions that were made, and he's doing well on uh, medical therapy. This is a sort of EKG. It's a terrible EKG. I shouldn't even show it, but I, there you go. Anyway, this is the sort of, this is the life of a clinical electrophysiologist, because these are the EKGs that we get on our phone. This is a, uh, uh, person with intermittent palpitation, was started on Coumadin and Diltiazem, came to the emergency room. And you can see that this is an atrial tachycardia. There are discrete upright P waves with a nice isoelectric segment between them. This is not atrial fibrillation. Here's a little bit better look after this person got a denison. Uh, you can see these discrete P waves marching through here. There's not an indication for anticoagulation in this tachycardia. It's not fib and it's not flutter. You can see either phase four left bundle aberration or ventricular escape right there if you're keeping score. Here's another person with, again, referred for atrial fibrillation with a discrete atrial arrhythmia that just marches right on through here. It's, there's a P wave buried under there and it pops back up again over here. Not atrial fibrillation, not atrial flutter, Oh, I did, I did throw some arrows in there, but a thoughtful presenter. Here is a uh, gentleman with palpitation after a mitral valve repair. And he uh, finally came to the emergency room with a bout of palpitation that did not stop. And I looked at this EKG and just, I had no idea, you know, what is I got my Swiss Kern calipers out. I looked at this intently. I did not know. But again, in my toolbox lives some diltiazem. So he did get a little bit of diltiazem. And then I thought I was able to make out these little subtle discrete atrial events living down here. Here's another EKG, which is a little bit better and it's not as tilted as that last one. But um, again, in your, in your management toolbox, something to slow the rate uh, might, be, uh, might be helpful to sort this out. This, is a, this fellow had an atrial tachycardia. Again, did not need, this is not an indication for anticoagulation. It is an indication for either ablation or medical therapy. Here is a fellow with coronary disease, prior inferior infarction. He's got uh, intermittent atrial fibrillation. He's got a CRTD. He presents to the emergency room with palpitation. So this is a largely, you know, you know, it's fairly regular rhythm with two patterns of QRS complex. This one here, which is right bundle, left axis with an inferior infarction pattern. And then this one right here, which has a little paste cure, it has a little pacer spike in front of it. So this bit over here is conducted and this is paste. 
It's a little hard to know what's going on in the uh, atrium. So what we're going to do is slow the rate with a little bit of diltiazem. And now you can see that all of these QRS complexes, they had been both conduct, you know, largely conducted and rarely paced. After a little bit of diltiazem, native conduction gives way. To, and all of these are now paced QRS complexes. And you get an idea as to what the atrial activity is. And it's this thing right here at about 150 beats per minute, either. So it's hard for me, excuse me, to tell whether this is atypical flutter or atrial tachycardia. Um, you'll notice that his pacemaker is still tracking this. It is not mode switched, either because mode switch is not turned on, which would be unusual, but more likely it's, it's hard for defibrillators and pacemakers to mode switch when the, the atrial rhythm that they, are, that they are looking at is slow like this. Most mode switches is, is turned on at 160 to 180 beats per minute. This arrhythmia is at 150 beats per minute. So the device does not identify this as either AFib or flutter, but it looks to be either atypical flutter or atrial tachycardia. The device is just tracking it close to as best as its upper rate, programmed upper rate limit will do. And this is also an introduction to some pacer stuff, which we're gonna talk about here in just a minute. This is after the patient went back to being in sinus rhythm. These QRS complexes are fully paced these look different because now they are fused between conducted sinus rhythm and this pacing spike, which is, this is his old EKG. And so that is uh, about what I wanted to say about atrial fibrillation, atrial tachycardia, and atrial flutter. Um, you know, there's all kinds, there's this, these differences are, you know, are super important if you're managing these patients with intent to either prescribe antiarrhythmic drugs or to take them to the EP lab, because you, you need to know or have a pretty good idea what the mechanism of the arrhythmia is before you embark on that. Uh, but even if you're not taking somebody to the EP lab or you're not trying to pick out an antiarrhythmic drug for them, the relevance of this is that some of these uh, you know, some of these rhythms respond to cardioversion, others don't. Uh, there are anticoagulation decisions that are, that are very important. You know, some of these atrial fibrillation and flutter are, have guideline indicated uh, antithrombotic regimens, but atrial tachycardia, SVT, uh, do not. And so uh, there's relevance even for the non-EP. So we could talk about pacemaker EKGs for weeks. Uh, it's a super complex business, but I just wanted to throw in this, uh, you know, in the past five, maybe 10 years, um, the business of, um, of interpret, you know, the EKG interpretation of, of paced rhythms has become more difficult. In the olden days, um, it, the interpretation of the pacemaker EKG was basically, you know, oversensing, undersensing, uh, lack of capture, this sort of stuff. And that was what you confined yourself to interpreting. And EKG interpretation for device patients has become super complex um, for reasons we'll talk about in a minute. Anyway, this is old school pacemaker stuff. This is a person with AFib, six sinus syndrome, had a crappy AV node, was started on medicines, had intermittent bradycardia, got a VVI pacemaker, came back to the clinic with intermittent fainting. And what you can see here is that here's a pacemaker that is not sensing properly. Here's a spike here, here's a spike here, here. And this pacemaker is firing even though there's a QRS complex directly in front of it that it should be listening to, but it's not. And as this pacer spike makes its way back into the T wave, it lands at this very vulnerable uh, portion of the T wave and starts this little bit of polymorphic arrhythmia, which stops and then later on returns. And this was the reason for the fainting and the, the fix for this 
is either to turn the pacemaker off or to correct the sensing. We chose to correct the sensing. This is another old school uh, EKG, but this is a gal who's had third degree heart block after repair of congenital heart disease, got an epicardial pacer, pacing system, had intermittent dizziness, one of the weaknesses of unipolar pacing systems is that they uh, have sensing issues because the antenna, uh, which is the, you know, the space, the sensing space between the, uh, you know, the, the can basically or the pacemaker generator and the lead tip is quite large. So you can pick up myopotentials, you can pick up EMI, all kinds of stuff. This is a person that with activity reported dizziness in near syncope. And you can see a couple interesting things here. One is that during muscle activity, that this activity is sensed by the unipolar pacing system and inhibits ventricular output. So you get these long periods of asystole. The other thing that it does is the atrial, this myopotential is sensed on the atrial channel. So it is then tracked by the, you know, it, it's interpreted as a you know, atrial, an atrial event and is tracked in the ventricle. So you get periods of asystole and you get periods of irregular ventricular pacing that when the patient stops moving, then return to sinus, sinus tachycardia in this case. And you don't see, uh, you know, unipolar pacing as often anymore because of this sort of uh, problem. The fix is going to be either pacemaker sensitivity reprogramming or a different a, a lead modification for this patient. So this again is uh, old school pacing interpretation. Here's another old school pacing interpretation. This is a person who had intermittent bradycardia, had a temporary pacemaker placed in the ICU, and had, uh, again, uh, uh, an inappropriately delivered pacing spike into the T wave initiates a little run of polymorphic ventricular arrhythmia. This is a pace, the problem is that this pacemaker is capturing well. You can see that it captures here, but it's not sensing well. So a sensitivity adjustment, and I think we could all benefit from a sensitivity adjustment, uh, including Mr. Pacemaker here. This pacemaker needs to understand that there was a QRS complex here and doesn't need to pace, so it's not pacing into the T wave. So these are examples of, here, here's a, another one we'll get to, but examples of just the way that, e, that EKG interpretation and device uh, patients used to be accomplished. This is a person with a DDD pacemaker, and you can see that there is a spike following each QRS complex, but it's not just randomly, it just sits right out there. This is a dual chamber pacemaker program DDD50 with an AV interval of 350 milliseconds. And the reason for that long AV interval was because they did not need ventricular pacing very often. But this is the, the intrinsic R wave on this pacemaker was two millivolts. The pacemaker sensitivity was set at three. So the pacemaker doesn't realize that there's a QRS complex here and just dutifully paces after every QRS complex. So this is a undersensing issue. So uh, there's a lot of, lot of new stuff that we're up to in the EP lab. And one thing that we're up to certainly in the last 10 or 15 years or so is biventricular pacing. So if you're into the EKG interpretation business, you're gonna to have to become familiar with bi -V pacing and what those QRS complexes uh, look like. And so uh, bi -V pacing systems typically have a lead in the right ventricle and a lead in the left ventricle. And so a bi -V capture is gonna have a more prominent R wave, sometimes nothing but R wave in V1 and here is a patient with a bi system who's back in clinic, just not feeling as good as they thought they would. And you can see that there's the QRS complexes have two different shapes. There's this fat one here, and then a slightly narrower one, and then it turns back to be the larger one again, and then the narrower one. 
And if you look up here in V1, you can see that there each QRS complex is preceded by two pacing spikes. One is for the LV output, the other is for the RV output, but the you don't always get consistent capture on both of these. And the ones you're getting consistent capture in the RV, which is this downward one here, and only intermittent capture in the LV one. So if you're in the business of interpreting EKGs, you're gonna read this as sinus rhythm with a, uh, with a bi-V pacing system with intermittent loss of LV capture. You know, no LV capture, successful LV capture. So this is ineffective CRT delivery and that might account for why this person doesn't feel as good. Here's a uh, gal with chronic atrial fibrillation, had an AV node ablation that was not felt to be completely effective, had a CRTP implant, uh, but was doing fine. Pacemakers programmed DDIR. This is an EKG from a clinic visit. And you can see uh, regular QRS complexes preceded by, there's two little pacer spikes hidden in there, but you get some of these little narrower ones here that are also have a little QRS complex, have a pacing spike in them. And here's what they look like if you get out your readers. So these are, these little narrower ones are conducted QRS complexes and this is uh, a fully paced QRS complexes, but these are conducted, but they have a pacer spike in them. So uh, the other um, feature that you'll see with some frequency in your, in your EKG pile is that conducted QRS complexes or PVCs will have a pacer spike in them. What is there, why is there a pacer spike in a native QRS complex? Well, many of these devices have what's called a pace on sensed response built into them. So if they hear something in the RV, they will pace across into the LV and there'll be a mysterious pacer spike sitting in a, an otherwise innocent looking QRS complex. And that's what that's all about. It's not lack of, it's not poor sensing. It is what's called pace on sensed response. And there are different reasons for why that might be turned on, which aren't critical right now. So another thing that you'll see are just some funny looking behaviors out of some of these devices. And this is what I'm, this is what I'm kind of getting at. And you could, you could talk for hours on some of these funny behaviors. You know, funny behavior number one is that devices will pace into, into QRS complexes um, Another funny behavior I'll demonstrate right here. So this is a person with chronic AFib, um, has, had, has had a poor EF, had an AV node ablation, and has a, has a biventricular pacemaker. It's programmed VVIR. So he came to Pacer Clinic, and you can see that this is, and this was just found in his pacemaker event log. You can see that he's pacing right along here, has a PVC, the PVC is coming from the RV. How do I know that? Because the RV is seen here first. But anyway, it's a PVC. And here's another couple PVCs. And then he has a little run of ventricular arrhythmia. The run of the ventricular arrhythmia is coming from the RV. And then when it's done, and this thing, the ventricular arrhythmia lasts, you know, two seconds. When it's done, suddenly the pacemaker is pacing at uh, 130 beats per minute. The pacemaker prior to this had been pacing at 75 beats per minute. And in response to this run of PVCs, it is now pacing at 135 beats per minute. What is going on? <coughs> Excuse me. And you can see this on this little plot here. Here is the, the pacer doing its little pacing thing. Here's a little run of these PVCs or non-sustained VT. And here's the pacemaker's behavior after this ventricular arrhythmia stops. It's pacing here and it slowly ramps down. And this is called ventricular rate uh, regulation. All right. Anyway, so 
the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the pacemaker software is much, much more complex than it used to be. It has all these little features that you can turn on and turn off that you'll see manifest on EKGs and you're wondering what is going on. And sometimes it's very difficult to tell unless you get your EP guy on the phone or you have the pacemaker programmer and know the details of these features. Here is a 78 year old gal with chronic atrial fibrillation has left bundle branch block has a CRT device in place. And this is her, her EKG from a clinic visit. This is this pacemakers program VVT. So it's each of these native QRS complexes here have pacer spikes in, in them, including this little PVC sitting here because the pacemaker has been told to uh, pace into these QRS complexes. So you're thinking pacemakers are devices that are notoriously regular. Here you have irregular ventricular pacing. How do you get irregular ventricular pacing out of a pacemaker whose programming is for it to be completely irregular? Well, one way is VVT. This is a patient I saw at the, I think I saw it with a fellow of mine. And this was a patient who got their device at the main campus and then transferred their care out to the IRL. And I looked at this and went, what is going on? So this person had chronic AFib, had heart block, coronary disease, mitral valve replacement, came for a routine pacemaker check and I was visiting with their pacemaker and this is what I found. So the atrial channel had this atrial arrhythmia, it looks like AFib. And here is the ventricular channel. Each one of these is ventricular sensing that is you know, basically perfectly regular. This is not, so the pace, this guy has third degree heart block and here you have this arrhythmia that's just, marching right on through. What is going on here? And I looked at this a little closer and each of these sensed events were preceded by little pacer spikes, two of them. Get out. What is going on? Well, he. this is a person who, unbeknownst to me, because this was my first visit with them, had a pacemaker implanted on the other side of his body. So the pacemaker that I was checking, this one was just sitting there listening to the activity of a pacemaker that was on the other side of his body. The patient had no idea what was going on. And I was kind of going through his chart, trying to figure this whole thing out and realized that there was, uh, his x-ray had this kind of funny thing on it. Crazy. So here is a gal, dilated myopathy, left bundle branch block, has chronic AFib, and has a uh, CRT pacemaker, it's program VVIR. And this person comes to clinic just feeling a little unwell. So they are taken down to the emergency room for care, maybe a little diuresis. And you can see that this pacemaker is doing something that VVI or VVIR pacemakers should not be doing. And that is, it is pacing irregularly. And as we talked about, pacemakers are notoriously regular. They're very fussy about it. And this pacemaker is pacing irregularly. Why would that happen? And again, this is one of those uh, one of those little features I want to uh, want to tell you about, and this is this pace on sensed response here. So you can see that this person has two types of QRS complexes. This type here, which is perfectly regular, and this type over here, which is irregular. So this type over, this is when the pacemaker is pacing, and the patient's in conducted rate has fallen below 75 beats per minute. So this is biventricular capture. 
these complexes over here and this one here and those two over there as well. These are conducted left bundle branch block that the pacemaker is pacing into using that pace on sensed response. So pace on sensed response uh, is a feature of most, well, I'll say many CRT devices and the stated intent of that feature is so that if somebody, they can, somebody can maintain CRT, uh, if they go into atrial fibrillation and this is conducted, even though their, um, uh, their heart rate uh, gets, gets faster. So this is, these are conducted left bundle branch block complexes, which are sensed on the RV channel. And then you get LV pacing. And the attempt is to maintain CRT during rapid AFib. But the, as a consequence, you're gonna see an EKG that just looks weird because the pacemaker is pacing irregularly. And that's why. So this is after a little bit of diltiazem, the heart rate starts to slow a little bit. Here's a fully by v paced. These are tracked pace on sense responses. And then the last four beats are these fully paced, fully CRT paced complexes. And here's after 10 milligrams of Deltaism. And so here's one that is conducted, but the rest of these are fully paced. So here's another funny thing. You have this device, which is pacing at a cycle length of 840 milliseconds. And then suddenly the device is seen to be pacing at 880 milliseconds. And the reason for that is that these devices have other features built into them. One of them is called ventricular rate regularization, where it sees a little beat like this one, try to sneak in there and it will, uh, well, it sees this beat sneaking in. So it's gonna pace a little bit faster for a while. The bottom line, and this is of course why I'm showing you these funny slides, um, is that the complexity of the EKG interpretation in device patients has just exploded. And there's all kinds of little irregularities and features that make EKG interpretation uh, super tough. Not like in the olden days. Under sensing, under capture, you know, that was pretty much all there was. So here's a uh, person with an AAI pacemaker that's doing something that AAI pacemakers or pacemakers in general don't do, which is pace irregularly. So here the pacemaker's pacing along, capturing in the atrium native AV conduction. Pacemakers, as we talked about, are notoriously regular. So something is going on right here in the middle here. And I think it's kind of cute. And what is going on, when you have a, this little pause like this, what you can do is take out your Swiss Kern calipers with the jeweled movement, get this interval stored in your caliper, put the right caliper point here and swing that interval back and see what it's sensing. And what you'll find is that this pacemaker, this AAI pacemaker is sometimes sensing a far field QRS complex. And you can infer that by using that little caliper thing. You go, what, what is it seeing? Well, it's seeing this QRS complex. And you can fix that in one of, one of a couple different ways. One is you can change the atrial sensitivity or two is you can take the PVAR and, uh, or the atrial refractory period and lengthen it. So you cover up that QRS complex. So we're down to our last few minutes here. I'm predicting there's not going to be many questions. So I wanted to just throw a few, um, a few examples of concealment and parasystole in there just because I find it so, so cool. So parasystole is the phenomenon and you can get it in the atrium or the ventricle where there is an ectopic focus that just marches right on through the tracing without regard to what else is going on. Sometimes <clears throat> you can have concealed parasystole, which is like magic. Uh, 
but anyway, peristole is like having a VOO uh, or AOO pacemaker working in your in your heart chamber. So you can see that there's this little focus here that just marches right on through. You don't see it here because that pacemaker fo or that little ectopic focus tried to make its appearance, but it landed in the T wave, and the ventricle just wasn't happening it having it. And same over here. So this. This little ectopic focus marches right on through here uh, without regard to uh, the, uh, what's going on in the rest of the heart rhythm. Here's another EKG again showing this paras ventricular parasystole with interpolated PVCs, sometimes not interpolated. Uh, but you can just march that right on through. Again, it's missing over here because it tried to escape, landed in a T wave. But if you had had the tracing to the left of that, you would have seen that, that little QRS complex pop back up again. Here's another example of parasystole. And this will be our last EKG. Uh, but it also shows concealment. Concealment is, if it's one of these EP terms um, that I think the term concealment is kind of awkward um, and inappropriate, but it's, it's a term that's used to, rep, to mean that inferred conduction. So um, you can see that this, there's a, this little ectopic focus moves through here. And right here, it, uh, I'm going to infer that this, that this that this PVC here made its way backwards and up into the AV node because of the effect it had on this next PR interval right here. This PR interval after the PVC is huge and stretched out. It's because this PVC conducted retrograde up into the AV node and uh, got in the way of this next P wave coming down. So it it's said to con having concealed its way back up into the AV node, concealed conduction. This little ectopic focus is also kind of interesting in that sometimes its appearance is delayed a little bit by the preceding QRS complex. Anyway, the clinical relevance of these is almost zero, um, except they, you'll see them on their EKG, and then if you identify them, they'll look like a stud. Um, all right, um, we have, have two minutes for questions, if there are questions. So come up here. Uh, yep, and go to chat. Is there a chat? I don't know. Um, oh, look up more up there and see. Can't we just unmute? Chat, yep. Well, we're looking if anybody's in the chat. I don't see anybody in the with questions in the chat. So if we don't have any further questions, uh, then I think, or, or if people come up with some later, let Randy know or get a hold of your physician liaison, and we'll get those questions to... Uh, Rick Hobson uh, for answers. Uh, but otherwise, uh, thanks everyone for joining and uh, we'll see you next time. Au revoir. Thanks. Thank you.